Welcome to the Mentionable Sunday Night Live, where we touch on theology, apologetics, current events, and more. If you'd like to get involved, make sure you're in the Facebook chat. Send us a question. Without further ado, let the show begin. All right, everyone. It is Sunday evening, which means this is uh, Sunday Night Live. Mentionable Sunday Night Live. I totally ruined up. I was or ruined that. I was going to have a great like. It's mentionable Sunday Night Live, and I totally biffed that one. So we're off to a fantastic start live. here. Live from Facebook. It's Sunday night. Yeah, live from the Nerd Cave. It's Sunday Night Mentionables. All right. So Joel, uh, how's your week been going? Why don't you? Talk for a minute while I set up the chat. <laughs> Sounds like a plan to me. Well, of course, I work at the Science Center. And so this week, we've been doing Beach Fun Week. So we just um, we have to do spectacles in addition to all kinds of different sciencey things that we set up for people. And it's hard to figure figure out what kind of sciencey things to do around the beach. So we decided to do a beach bonfire, except instead of using wood for our fire, we pumped methane into soapy water and made giant soap bottle, bubbles full of methane and then lit them and watched them go um, up in flames inside a building. So that's my Very kind of science. Nice. Very nice. Good deal. Okay. So, uh, what, sorry, what were you saying? Uh, that was everything I said. Oh, okay. You I thought you had some. Yeah. Uh, you know, just trying to keep you on your toes. So, all right. This week, I thought uh, I would I would like to talk about at least um, methodology and evangelism. Uh, and let me give you and anyone else listening uh, the backstory to that. So, I got saved in 2007. So, 2007, I got saved. And God put a burden on my heart for the lost, like, basically instantly. Like once I understood the gospel was, was beyond even life and death. Um, I was like, Oh man, you know, I need to really take this seriously. And I think my heart was in the right place, but the execution, uh, was not good for, for quite a while. Um, I can think of a number of instances where, uh, you know, I was, instead of being a surgeon's scalpel, I was a Scottish claymore, um, <laughs> Uh, taking, you know, big, uh, big, yeah, big swipes, so to speak, uh, at people when uh, all that was needed or all that was necessary, uh, was a scalpel, so to speak. So I remember, um, uh, I was, uh, sitting down with a family member, um, and I had just gotten back from, uh, what you call it, uh, the ambassadors, ambassadors academy, that's hosted by Ray Comfort and his uh, his organization, Living Waters. And it was a great organization. Um, they were totally cool, really nice, really helpful. Um, and they took us out to the streets and we started open air preaching, handing out tracts, talking to people and so on. And so, you know, that's obviously, I mean, for our culture, that is pretty intense, pretty forthright. Um, you know, I'm not trying to say, oh, yeah, look at how awesome I was there. But it's just, it is what it is. It's very That's straightforward. Uh, yeah, uh, but it's very straightforward uh, evangelism. Yeah. And I had just gotten back from this conference, so I was extraordinarily gung-ho. And I sat down with a family member who um, is not gospel-friendly in the slightest. Um, and I proceeded to lay out because this person wasn't aware fully of, of my beliefs and my understanding of salvation coming through Christ alone and so on. And, uh, and now I'm not saying we need to back off on, on the, obviously on the, um, the, the non-negotiables. I'm not advocating for that whatsoever. Um, but the way I said it was very kind of cold, hard hearted, overly blunt, unnecessarily, confrontational um and really not helpful and uh so you know, for years there's been a really kind of an uh, kind of an uneasy time around this person and um it's it's something that i've i've had to adjust to over the years and learn like okay first of all um we have to realize that 
even the apostles didn't reach every possible person. They, they took breaks like everybody else. Um, that we are not, we are not called to speak the gospel every second of every single day. We are called to, you know, break bread together. We are called to be parents and, and, uh, you know, you know, or to be children or, or whatever else. And I, I, I really had to, because I was so focused on the great commission, um, it, it, it focused on it to, to, uh, like a legalistic fault. Uh, I had to really kind of go, okay, calm down, hang on a second. What is your duty? You know, second Peter three fifteen, the classic verse, you know, uh, always be ready to give an answer for those, uh, who ask about your faith and so on within that verse is giving an answer to those who ask. So it's, it's respect. sorry, say that again. You broke up a little bit. I said, but do it with gentleness and respect in the same yeah. verse. Yeah, exactly. So do it with gentleness and respect. And by having them ask you, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, um, assuming that, Hey, you're going to have conversations and that will lead into this. Um, whereas the, the kind of approach that I had taken was so kind of blasting straightforward and blunt, um, that it, it, it was unnecessarily confrontational. Uh, and it was a, a roadblock or a hurdle, if you will, not that my actions are going to impede the Holy spirit, obviously, but, um, in kind of practical terms, it's putting up unnecessary barriers in which a good relationship should be strived for, uh, not compromising the truth, but still should be striving for a good relationship. So that's kind of my thought on that. And this is, I know this is kind of gospel 101, but this is something that is, that was, it took a while for it to me to kind of calm down in my own mind, like, okay, calm down, Neil, still do the great, you know, still obviously fulfill the great commission, but you don't have to be so blunt or obsessive about it. It, it you, it, it's okay to kind of let things come a little bit more naturally. Um, so, and this is not a criticism of anyone who's doing very straightforward, very, you know, bam, out there evangelism. I, I applaud and am thankful for those people, but I know f- for me, I have uh, allowed it to become a detriment. So what are your, what are your thoughts, Joel? Well, um, I think that it's somewhat like Reese's peanut butter cups. There is no right way or wrong way to preach the gospel. And my proof text for that is in, uh, I want to think it's, I, I think it's Ephesians um, where Paul says that some people have been preaching the gospel in this spirit of meanness or something like that. But he says that regardless of the motivation, the gospel is being preached mm-hmm. and What I take from that in general is that, um, first off, I'm firmly of the belief that salvation comes through Christ and through the working of the Spirit. Um, And so we are ancillary to that uh, goal, and any way in which we participate is our privilege, not necessary to God. Um, Given that, I don't think that that becomes an excuse to not do or say anything. But I think that I believe, and this I back this up with my own life and situations I've experienced, that God places individuals uh, in the areas that he wants those individuals to, you know, to exercise their particular strengths. And, you know, in some ways also to gain strengths by challenges that are put in their path. So I have a lot of skills currently that I never tried to get. And they came circumstantially, like, for instance, I worked for a salesman for a number of years. Uh, Out of that experience, I'm much more comfortable with, you know, cold approaches to people and engaging engaging in conversations and, you know, not so shy around people. But I never wanted to be a salesperson. And I'm not going to say I was great at it, but I gained some strengths from it. Now, your story is uh, similar to what I, you know, as a Christian journalist, I covered a great many conversion stories, including yours, by the way. I think I wrote yours up at one point. Yeah, Yeah, I think uh, so. Many moons ago. Yes. But whenever I uh, cover a story of somebody who is converted in adulthood, or yeah, in adulthood, um, 
it's a very similar story in that there's a great enthusiasm that comes right in that moment of conversion and persists for a while afterwards. Now, I don't think that for mo- in most cases that lasts for the rest of their life, but there is a period of months or possibly years when you're so excited over this purpose and meaning that you found, you've discovered the meaning of life and how many people could say that. And so this excitement leads to this desire to share it with other people. And that's no bad thing. Um, I think that's good. Now, I never experienced that because I grew up in a Christian home, grew up in a Christian church. I was saved practically from the womb. And, you know, I couldn't even tell you you the moment of salvation for myself, having been raised in that situation. I grew up in an evangelical church. It was called Evangelical Methodist. And uh, there was a lot of pressure. It was a legalistic church in general. There was a lot of pressure to be evangelistic, to tell other people. It was There's like, you don't tell method. other people you go to hell kind of dealy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Apparently. <laughs> but, but at any rate, that was the kind of environment I came out of. And, you know, the pressure was excruciating, you know, and, and this is what I was raised as a child. I don't feel that I have a good grasp on how to cold approach somebody in evangelism. And that's not really my strength, but I don't think that I, you know, I have strengths and I use them to the best of my ability. So different people exercise salvation in different ways or evangelism, I should say in different ways. Um, You mentioned first Peter three 15, the, you know, classic, apologetics test text since it has the word apologia in there and uh you know it says always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within you and then it ends with but do it with gentleness and respect and that's key in my mind you know you you don't come in like a claymore uh swinging and do nothing and in my in my book i talk about this you know approach for evangelism and apologetics wherein you um, you do it as a conversation, almost like a Socratic conversation. You ask questions. You find out what they think. Then you ask for them to think more deeply about what their views and, and so, such are. At some point, when you question back along their line of reason and you, you pay a lot of attention and give them respect, you want to know what they think. You know, want to know their worldview. At some point, they're going to inevitably come up against a wall that they never really thought about in their worldview, and they don't have a solution to that. And that's where my salesmanship comes in, because I can present them with a solution to the problem in their, to the flaw in their worldview. I have that solution ready and and able to go. So that would be my approach to evangelism is have a respectful conversation, question about their line of reasoning. At some point, you're going to, they're going to run into a wall where they have some kind of assumption that they have no basis for, you know, for like morality. That's the classic one. Where is their sense of morality coming from? What makes something right or wrong? And then I have the solution to that problem. So that would be my approach. Yeah. Okay. So Joel, what is your new thing this week? So this week, my new, new thing is, um, Daredevil Comics. Now, right off the bat, you know, here we are on a Christian forum as part of a Christian organization, and I'm pitching a comic book. Um, I, I th- think it is okay, and maybe you'll agree with me, for Christians to engage in, you know, secular fiction, uh, you know, secular entertainment. Um, I know for a fact that you do, so you're not going to disagree with me off the bat, right? Now, having said that, there's something about Daredevil that I that I can tie back into my Christian worldview, which really it, it's it's an astounding kind of dichotomy that they've placed into that character. So, of course, the character was created by Stan Lee. Ever heard of him? Uh, let's now, see. I can think of about 19 or 20 movies I've seen recently that he was in. Yeah. Okay, all right. So he's this guy, and he wrote a comic. And he, you know, for a guy who wrote in the 1960s, he was he was a really good fiction author. Um, you could still go back and read those early comics and get into him because he he wrote like a soap opera writer. 
and he brought you in because you, you cared about the characters. Mm-hmm. But he creates this character, mm-hmm. Daredevil, and his conceit was he wants to make a blind superhero. And so he does the, you know, he does the Kung Fu thing where you have this blind fighter who has heightened senses in all the other areas. And so he's able to fight that way. Um, But he decides that in his personal life, the guy's going to be a lawyer. Now, that was an intentional choice on Stan Lee's part because he chose this profession because you have this statue you see outside of courthouses sometime of this lady with a blindfold on uh holding the scales of justice and of course the motto underneath is it's in latin but what it says is justice is blind now Mm -hmm. what does that mean it doesn't mean that justice isn't capable of discerning things instead it's it's actually a biblical principle it's justice is not a respecter of persons you know, mm-hmm. and, and then in James, you have this passage about, you know, how a rich man will come in and the church will favor the rich man over the poor man. And he says that should not be. Well, it's the whole thing. All people are equal under the law, regardless of their background, uh, their culture, um, race, religion, sex. Justice is only looking for the truth behind their actions to deliver to immediate justice. But mm-hmm. Stan Lee did it because it's a blind uh, thing and he wanted a blind superhero. So he thought it was a good choice. But it yeah. gets better than that because the whole theme of this character is the exploration of what justice is. So this guy is ironically a lawyer and a good one. And he, you know, he tries to take these charity cases where he stands up for people who are unrepresented unrep- and, um, you know, try to help them out. Uh, so he works within the legal system with an eye towards bringing true justice, legal justice. Yeah. But then at night, he puts on a costume and he wor- operates outside the law as a vigilante administering personal justice. Here, he's not letting the state decide what is just and what isn't just. He's making personal decisions about who needs to be punished and so forth. So mm-hmm. he's got this inconsistency uh, in the character. But the best part is he's also a Catholic. So he circles back around to this idea of what is justice, cosmic justice, mm-hmm. you know, and he has these soul searching moments where he's the, the comic I, I, dozens of times. And I've read it. He's actually in the church questioning, you know, essentially the problem of evil. I more mm-hmm. than once I've seen him sit down with like a priest or his mother is a nun now. And so Mm -hmm. he'll talk to her and so forth and ask why there's so much evil in the world and so forth. Now, I'm not going to refer anybody to the comic book to have a really profound answer to the problem of evil. Um, Usually it boils down to this, uh, you know, that. uh, Yeah, yeah. Usually when they answered, it boils down to this whole, well, you know, it's our duty as people to go out and make a better world. And mm-hmm. so forth. So it just kind of comes down to that. It's not terrible, but it's not great either. But yeah. you know that whole balance of you've got lawyer, vigilante, Christian, and he's got this uh, triforce in there. Now, an- another really cool thing about the comics is that they frequently put this character at odds with the Punisher. Now, of course, the Punisher is this guy who's decided that he's judge, jury, and executioner. Emphasis mm-hmm. on executioner part. Um, and that he's going to administer justice to the world in a black and white fashion where you're either guilty or you're innocent. If you're guilty, you die. And his idea is that if you kill all the guilty people, then you've created a perfect world. And so this is in opposition to Daredevil, who in some fashion believes in reform, believes that the justice system can ultimately come out on top. So all of that said, I'm not going to recommend that Christian parents run out and grab the Daredevil comic book and give it to their kids because the comic book also is violent and has a lot of uh, risque material therein. Uh, okay. um, but I love the overarching themes and I can appreciate those as a Christian. I was going to say, I, I watched, I want to say, because it's, wasn't it a Netflix series or is it a Netflix series or I thought there was one. Uh, it is. Like a, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I watched a few episodes and 
it, it was a little too dark for my taste, but it was a very interesting concept. And hearing your kind of elaboration, um, like with the Punisher, you know, you it's it's really interesting because the Punisher, from my understanding, here we are talking theology and comic books. It's really funny, um, but like you have know, right? <laughs> the Punisher who has kind of a nihilistic, moral relativistic kind of outlook, if I understand correctly, and you have Daredevil who has a much more theologically based uh, kind of Western uh, Western tradition based, if you will. Uh, outlook of the world mm -hmm. and you, it's like how you were talking it's it's a very even though they're they're trying to reach the same ends which is justice you have one side saying well what is justice daredevil trying to go okay justice is trying to work it out and the punisher just going justice is whatever i say it is bam done yeah. uh so that's that's really i i you know i if i had a, a cap i tip it to you that's that's a very very interesting uh Use of comic books and theology there. So, uh, so were there any more? Oh, like were there any of those? Were there any more serious topics you wanted to bring up, or did you want to go to thumbs up, thumbs down? Let's uh, let's slip right into thumbs up, thumbs down. All right. Let's see, someone uh, on the mentionables. Let's see, has the mentionables, and it wasn't me, so that leaves it to like two people. Uh, it says Godzilla is the true king of monsters. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Do we have instead, the thumbs up, thumbs down graphic? Well, no, I I don't have the graphic. So, but since this also goes out as a podcast, we need to actually say thumbs up, thumbs down. I was listening to a past episode the other day. I like, go, oh, Joe, what say you? And it was just this long silence, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's where he put it up to the camera. <laughs> I need to make sure to say it from now on. I, I heard that too. Uh, it was good times. All right, so Joel, what say you? Godzilla is the true king of monsters. Okay. Um, I like that, but ultimately I'm going to go ahead and give it a thumbs down. And that's okay. because I have somebody else in mind as the true king of monsters. The true king of monsters, uh, Godzilla goes back to like the, like the 1930s, 40s, something like that. The one I'm thinking of is in pulp fiction as far back as the 1920s. And that is the great Cthulhu. I talk uh, about him a lot, but maybe you haven't heard. I've I've heard I've heard the the name. Yeah. Uh, let's see, King of Monsters. Okay. So, King of Monsters. I'm I'm assuming here. Then we're going with fictional, like actual monster monsters. Hmm. It also depends on what you classify as a monster, because I get to thinking about, you know, okay, well, is Thanos a monster or is he more of an alien? Or then you start thinking about uh, uh, Dormammu, uh, you know, so you get into all that. So if we're going strictly with fictional monsters, I'm going to have to go with yes to Godzilla because I can't think of anything anything more. I mean, he, he's what, shoots lasers and everything else. So I don't know. He, he's, he's got a... Uh, Not he, lasers, he's, radiation. Radi okay, radi radiation. Well, okay, Mr. Science Guy. Technically, a laser is electromagnetic radiation. Or, yeah, anyway, moving on. Timothy Fox. Now, this is an interesting one. Taxation is theft. What say you, Joel? Well, I'm not as into political theory as some, but I'm just going to generally agree to that. Thumbs up. Because um, okay. I can think of ways the government could function with less taxation and, in fact, has in the past. Oh yeah. Um in in general taxation is theft. Boy that it it really depends. I think it really depends on kind of the innate agreement or contract, if you will, not that there's necessarily a paper contract, but the agreement between the parties, between the citizens and between the government. Um and also then you have to go to okay, well, is this thing that's being taxed for a legitimate role of the government or is it not a legitimate role of the government so things like uh spending on the military well obviously i wouldn't classify that as theft because that's a that's a protective measure the governments take to protect their citizens and so i would say properly utilized taxation is not theft 
the problem is, is that most governments, I would say uh, probably almost every government in the world right now uh, has programs or is doing things that aren't within the purview of that government. Um, so uh, th this one's, this one's so tough, man. Um, well, I'll expand on it a bit. I, I think ahead. that the founding fathers in terms of uh, taxation without representation. Um, so mm -hmm. if your interests aren't being represented by the government, then you're basically paying an institution that is giving you nothing in return. So in terms of pure economy, you pay for things that profit you. And so, I, you know, it wouldn't be theft if I'm paying the government for services that it's giving me. Mm -hmm. In that respect, yeah, but there has to be like a willingness and taxation, at least, at least nowadays, is forcefully taking money that I've earned um, against my will necessarily. Yeah, and as the great prophet Chris Rock once said, you know, government, you don't pay taxes, government takes tax. Um, you know, they just, just swipe it from you before you even get it. And so, yeah, within, if, if they're taking it from you before you're even able to receive it for, for means that are not within the proper purview of the government, then I would say yes. So I, I will say that that one's so tough. Uh, I'll just give it a thumbs up. Sure. Whatever. All right. Moving on. Han Solo shot first. Oh, what do you think? Clearly that's a thumb up. I, uh, I, I watched the original Star Wars before the George Lucas edits and what the late nineties, it was like 96, 95, something like that. Uh -huh. So Han, so really, he'd really, I'd like, I, I know people have talked about this. I've never really paid attention to it. It looked to me, honestly, um, like he shot afterward, but I, I could yeah, be wrong. That, that was after the edit. So basically if you look at the, at the current version, um, what you'll see is there's kind of a CGI-ish thing where he, they pull his head to the side and then the beam strikes him next to his head. So that's in the current version. But if you look at the original cut before the 90s edits, um, basically Han pulls it out and just shoots him underneath the table dead. And mm -hmm. Greedo isn't even aware that that's going on. <laughs> he just okay. zero to dead without any... So I think uh, Lucas specifically changed that because he didn't want like this cold blooded murder. He wanted Han to be a fair guy and shoot after him. But the fans really liked the cold blooded murder. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, I just got to shake my head at that one. All right. Uh, catch up. We already talked about catch up a couple of weeks ago. I don't want to talk about catch up again. All right. I didn't now this. That one. <laughs> This one is very interesting, um, and I can think of a couple of individuals uh, who will have strong opinions on this. Answers in Genesis, that is Ken Ham's organization, excuse me, Ken Ham's organization for Young Earth Creation. Answers in Genesis does more harm than good. What do you say, Joel? Okay, so um, here's the thing. In your more conservative church circles. Apologetics is spelled A-I-G. So basically, you know, the cold approach for the apologist in the very conservative church is to go in and start arguing evolution right away. You know, mm -hmm. so the cold approach would be like, so do you believe that we came from apes or something like that? And yeah. then hit them with all the evidence against evolution. And somehow that equals evangelism in those circles. Um, regardless of the truth or falsity of evolution, I don't think that that's a helpful approach to take uh, to evangelism because you walk into a room and you've immediately placed yourself in this science versus religion dichotomy that people already believe exists. That dichotomy mm -hmm. doesn't have to exist and doesn't necessarily exist, but Answers in Genesis, I mean, they at least try to use science to back up their claims, but it's, you know, basically literal reading of Genesis and then try to cram science into that literal reading. I'm not going to dismiss that kind of science, but I don't think it's helpful in terms of evangelism. And it does set up this science versus faith dichotomy that has harmed the church more than it's helped the church. Uh, I would prefer to remain a little bit more agnostic in terms of the science as it compares to the Bible. 
Oh boy. Uh, this, this is a, a tough nut to crack. First of all, um, I know some of answers in Genesis. I haven't been keeping track of them a whole lot recently. Um, I do know that I've seen some discussions with Ken Ham uh, that that seem really um, unnecessarily divisive. Uh, maybe that's a, a way to put it, um, because I think I think the problem is is that it's it's insisting that a hermeneutic, only one hermeneutic, is. Uh, it, not only legitimate but possible. Like, uh, I, I basically from from a really hardcore young Earth standpoint, as I understand it, not that every young Earth believes this way, but um, basically the only way to interpret the the Hebrew word yom for day is literal twenty four hour period. Um, you know, one rotation of the Earth, um, and that runs into a numbers of a number of problems. Not the least bit that the sun wasn't in that uh, thing uh, in that model really created until the fourth day. So, you know, how do you have days for the fourth day, so to speak? Um, so I think it, I, I believe at the core of it is a desire for people to adhere to the scriptures. And I wholeheartedly love and endorse that sentiment that, you know, be faithful to the scriptures. Let's, let's trust God on this. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, I just, I, I think, I think the way they go about it sometimes can be a little too rough and a little too narrow, um, and, and a little unnecessarily divisive at times. But I, I do think that what is really motivating them is a desire for people to be faithful to the word of God and that I have to applaud. Yeah. Um, I, again, I've, I've covered this before, but. Uh, this idea that you have to be absolutely certain uh, in order to, you know, for, for the Bible to be true or to be a Christian and so forth. So there's this real yearning for absolute certainty over things. And so that's why people are really, really dogmatic about their concepts of Genesis or, or you know, origins in general. So you've got people who, you know, everybody takes their, their own stand on Genesis 1, and that's their stand. So let's say it's a young or an old earth creationist, you know, they'll, they'll find a way of interpreting Genesis one to match science in terms of an old earth, but also keep it true in terms like a literal historical narrative. Um, and then, you know, every, everybody's got their own way and, <laughs> and it has to be certain. And that's why they, it, it, engenders so much argument among people because it's something that people are really, really concerned about for some reason. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. And, and just to kind of circle back around, I think what they're really concerned about is people being faithful to the scripture, not falling away because we've seen so much of that in the past. I mean, gosh, just, I mean, just even in our lifetimes, we've seen a ton of that. Um, but I mean, you, you extrapolate that back, you know, 50, 100, 150 years, you know, it's still, you know, people falling away. Um, yeah. All right. Moving on. Uh, the Freemasons are a cult. What say you, Joel? Uh, I really don't know enough about Freemasons to answer this question. I'm going to give it a tentative thumbs down because I, you know, you don't see them being evangelical. Um, you don't even see them doing much in terms of religion or having worldviews or so forth. It just seems like a lot of rit rituals and, and so forth, kind of like a club type thing. If they had more doctrine and, uh, you know, people were actually going to regular meetings and different things like that, I might be a little more liable to say that they were cult, but I think at this point, they're more like a club than they are a cult. Okay. Um, this one's, this one's tough. Um, just because, uh, uh, relationships that I have with people who are, or were, uh, Freemasons. Um, I've heard so much conflicting information. Um, I've heard, you know, the, some people talk about, you know, secret 
satanic rituals. And I've heard other people go, yeah, we just kind of hang out and drink beer and talk. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like, what information are you going to believe? So, um, I, I don't know. This, this one's tough. This one's really tough. I, let, let me put it this way. You, you can't deny the gospel and you can't deny Christ. If that is happening there, then there's serious concern for that, that group. Um, if it's not, then I, I wouldn't be any more concerned about any other social gathering. So the, that one's tough. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to wuss out and pass on this one. I, I, I think it's just really dependent upon how it's executed and, and who's there. And, and frankly, the lack of information. All right. Uh, well, so the, Freemasons, the Freemasons come from this very, very old tradition uh, stretching back centuries of these sort of clubs. Uh, and so, you know, they were groups of like-minded people that would get together and engage in activities, essentially, uh, together. But they would do so and build kind of rituals and routines into that um, to sort of distinguish themselves uh, from other clubs. So it was almost like being a sports fan at the time. You know, mm -hmm. you had your own deal and your own way of talking and your own handshakes and stuff like that, because this was part of a community that you got to be part of. And yeah. so, I, I mean, some of them actually did turn into cults, but the Freemasons pretty much one of the only han hangovers from this hundreds of years old uh, idea of having these secret clubs. And, you know, I, I don't think it's much more than just a secret club that holds a lot of these old rituals that have been passed down for hundreds of years now. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. That one, there's so much, I don't know. I've heard, like I said, all over the spectrum. So it's it's really hard for, for me to come down on that one. Um, Jonathan Archer was the best enterprise captain. Now, was that was that the one that ran in the early 2000s? Was that the Star Trek from the uh, early 2000s? I think so. I think that was from Enterprise. Yeah. The, the guy okay. from Quantum Leap, the uh, captain. Yes. I, you know. Never, never saw an episode of it. See, my wife and I watched the whole series. We loved that show. We loved it. My, my oh. wife is a Trekkie. She loves Star Trek. Uh, she doesn't like dress up like a hood or you anything like that. And you don't know the name of the guy? I can't, we watched it years ago, man. I can't remember the name of the character. Um, so, you know, I really liked him as captain. I thought he was really good. Um, now, was he better than, say, like Patrick Stewart? That would be hard because I, I've i only seen maybe three episodes of The Next Generation. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know. I, I He was a great cat. I really liked Jonathan Archer. I thought he was really good. Um, it would be hard for me to fairly say yay or nay but just because you know what i'll i'll give it a thumbs up just just for the heck of it yeah sure jonathan Ar archer was the best uh, enterprise i'm gonna give it a thumbs down and i'll I, I tell you that i'm giving it a thumbs down because uh captain kirk kind of hails back to this old 1950s pulp sci-fi um sort of square jawed uh caricature the you know from that time period he was like a throw pack to these really classic sci-fi uh what do you call them tropes i guess mm -hmm. um and, and, and i like that i like that throw back to sort of a, a a particular trope that you just don't see going forward uh that kind of aspect of sort of built-in manliness um and you know the the balance between him and Spock, where Spock was all analytics and logic, and Captain Kirk was all, you know, bravado. And, yeah, and he, he operated intuitively. You know, he went with his gut, and for some reason, his gut was usually right. <laughs> and so it was a good dynamic, and I like that character. So I, I'm sticking with Kirk for now. Okay. All right. Ooh, now this one, this one. The Last Jedi was trash. <laughs> Joel, go ahead. Go first on this one. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Joel. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give it a thumbs up. I'll give it a thumbs up 
And I'll do so for one specific reason. If there was anything I was looking forward to in a new trilogy, well, there were two things I was looking forward to. I was looking forward to seeing new force powers that we hadn't seen before. And I got that. I got that. Uh, there were two specific ones in the, uh, in the Force Awakens. You saw uh, Kylo like stretch out his hand and stop the laser beam right in its That track. was so cool. I remember going, whoa. And, <laughs> when I saw the theater, I was yeah. like, okay, that was, cool. that was really cool. Sorry, I know then, married, but, man, that was cool. Spoilers, uh, in The uh, Last Jedi, you see um, Luke pull off that sort of Jedi force uh, ghost, whatever it was. And mm-hmm. that was cool, too. I like that. The hologram um, or whatever. But the other thing, yeah, the other thing I was looking forward to is, uh, so episode six, Return of the Jedi, y- you see uh, Luke finally take the turn from being kind of a whiny farm boy to being a true Jedi. Like he was stoic. He was in control. He like walked in and he knew what he was doing. And, and you know, he walked right into Vader's presence. You know, I mean, this kid had some power and some talent he was finding his own finally as a jedi and then roll in credits and you don't get to see you know what he's like as a jedi knight so that was the other thing i was looking forward to in the new new trilogy is to just at least get to see luke as a full-fledged jedi um and you know that was kind of killed you didn't get to see that at all He, he did like one thing and then he died and that was the end of that movie. So, yeah. and then the other thing is like at the end of the movie, you, I get the feeling that they were going for this whole, no longer is the force running in a single family. Now the force is for everybody. So you have that scene at the end where the kid like picks up the broom with the force and, mm-hmm. you know, it's now an egalitarian thing where the they've spread the force out and it's not a few specific people that have access to it. Now it's going to be everybody. And I don't know, that's boring. It's like uh, like the guy from Incredibles says, if everybody has superpowers, then nobody's uh, super. If so, everybody's special, then opinion. nobody's special. Yep. Sorry, hang on. Let me mute my phone. It just started ringing on me real quick. There we go. Um, Syndrome. So, that was his name. Syndrome. Syndrome. Yes. Yes. I need to see the second one, too. It looks yeah. it looks hilarious. I, I want to see the second one. All right. Uh, Have a so the statement was the last Jedi was trash. I'm going to give that statement a thumbs down. I'm not going to say it's trash, but I do believe it left a lot. I, I do believe it was underwhelming. Um, gosh, you know, it's. Uh, I, I found the kind of going to the casino thing unnecessary, kind of dumb. Like it, it, really kind of detracted from you know like we're being chased down by the empire uh that just kind of was silly to me i, I didn't like that and then you have oh, benicio yeah. del toro in there yeah and benicio del toro they bring in there for some reason this weird pirate guy who it his character seemed to serve absolutely no purpose like i i i, I don't know like other than yeah he's our ride back like, it just that was annoying to me um i what i was really excited about in the movie though was for about 30 seconds when ray and kylo are fighting together i was like yes i was super excited uh i was like all right kylo this is going to be uh an active uh, not just like a ending retribution story like vader at the very end you know saves his son or whatever but like an active conversion if you will uh, from the dark side back to light, and now he's actively fighting against the dark side. Like I, that, I think would have been an incredibly cool storyline um, to see Kylo and Ray go up against Snoke uh, in more of kind of an extended, an extended way. Um, there were things I liked about it, um, but yeah, it was underwhelming, and I, I hated the fact that Luke became such just a, just annoying. I didn't like him. I didn't like Luke in this movie. It just bothered me. Um, and I'm like, that's not Luke. Yeah. It, it, this is some crusty old, it, I mean, I, and I get the, I get the backstory and everything else, but frankly, I would be more interested in seeing a movie about Luke training Kylo. Uh, 
I think that would have been more interesting than the last Jedi personally. So I, I'm not yeah, going to say in the first trash, trilogy, but it was underwhelming. In the first trilogy, like the defining characteristic of Luke is that he constantly risks his life to save his friends. Like from the very first movie, he's like storming into the prison cell to get the princess when he didn't have to. And, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the second movie, he's training in the swamp and he sees his friends are in trouble and he runs off and, you know, faces down Vader to save his friends. And, you know, he does a similar thing. That he, so like this whole idea of Luke, like putting himself at risk because of absolute loyalty. And then in the new trilogy, you know, zero loyalty, zero putting himself at risk. Even when he goes to save him, he's not putting himself at risk. So that was yeah. upsetting. No, it's yeah, it's it's like a it's a, a reversal of um what's the word I'm looking for here? It's a reversal of the I guess what we would hope for in the the moral moral stances or the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh I can't anyway. Anyway, but yeah, I just Yeah, it I can't. Anyway, whatever. Moving on. All right, this is the last one. Boneless wings are just chicken okay. nugget. My my go first. Go All ahead, right. Joel. I'll give that a thumbs down. I honestly, bones are an inconvenience for me when it comes to chicken. I'm happy with any chicken dish that whatsoever uh, that doesn't have bones in it. Uh, it doesn't mean I won't eat chicken with bones in it. It just takes longer. And I'm about quick meals. That's what I'm all about. <laughs> <laughs> See, I... I like um, Pizza Hut actually has some decent boneless wings. They have a uh, Parmesan uh, boneless wings, pretty good. And I would say those are more than chicken nuggets. Chicken nuggets are still really, I mean, now if we're talking McDonald's, McDonald's chicken nuggets are good. They are really good. Um, it is fast food, yes, but I still really like them. <laughs> okay. Um, boneless wings are just chicken nuggets. I, I think. I would have to give that a thumbs down because a boneless wing, I think still has the, um, what you call it. We're talking about chicken wings. Can you believe this? Um, <laughs> like a boneless wing. <laughs> yes. still has like the, 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 the muscular structure, so to speak. Like you still have kind of the, the tissue still at least intact, even though it's cooked and removed from the bone, the tissue is still intact in a nugget. It's puree fry nugget. Uh, so I would have to give that one yeah. a thumbs down. So that I think there is a, okay. a very distinct difference there. So, all right, Joel, uh, we are just about to wrap up here. Would you like to say anything before we take off? Uh, well, I mean, uh, give the regular pitch. Make sure that you uh, visit the website, thementionables.org. That's where we're doing all our stuff. Uh, just to give people, we're, we're on a much uh, more consistent schedule of content production now. So, Mondays we do uh, we release an article. Tuesdays we release our podcast. Wednesdays we do our question of the week um, article. So we have a number of the mentionables respond to a question that we've received. Uh, Thursdays we release content on our YouTube channel, uh, Mentionables TV, and um, then Fridays it's another article. And then of course Sundays we do this Sunday Night Live. So. You know, subscribe to the page, Facebook page. All the stuff that we update is right there. And of course, we've got a, our book, The Mentionables Project, available on Amazon now. Yeah, even though I think I accidentally posted this to my personal Facebook page, I think I launched it from there instead of the actual Mentionables page. But I'll still post this video on the the Facebook page. But I feel like a dork, um, so I will make sure that gets fixed yeah. next time. Um, uh, also, a uh, couple of sure. things. Uh, the wildfires in California, I grew up in California, so uh, keep them in your prayers. That's that's affecting a lot of people up in Northern California, so be praying for them. And um, I will, uh, we're not going to have MTV or Sunday, sorry, not MTV, Sunday Night Live next week. Uh, I will be out of town. So um, okay. in two weeks, we will see you again. And thanks and God bless everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on the Mentionable Sunday Night Live. For more information, check out TheMentionables.org. And there you can connect with us via Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and our other social media platforms. Until next time, take care.